Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is a distinguished bureaucrat in the best connotations of the term. He's combined administrative acumen with intellectual vigor. Uh, he worked for a year at Oxford University on disinvestment of public sector units. Um, he contributes extensively to prestigious publications like the Harvard Business Review, the Economic and Political Weekly. He started the Disinvestment Ministry and today heads the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Pradeep Bajan. You recently wrote about, sort of with some excitement, about the future of broadband and how that might come into India. What do you envision happening 10 years from now? How is that going to change our landscape? Uh, you will have to go back to mobile to understand why uh, we took this initiative on broadband. Last year when we came here, the number of mobiles were 10 million. And we found that there was an, a huge addressable market. But the numbers were not going up. So we took certain actions and the number in one year went up to 30 million. So first eight years, 10 million, ninth year, 30 million. So we found that there is uh, a possibility of expanding the market in any sector if the price is right, if the availability is good. Then we looked at the broadband sector and, and in broadband we found that there were so many uh, physical barriers, fiscal barriers, monetary barriers that broadband was not coming up. I refuse to believe that there is no demand for broadband. Uh, you, uh, look at our economy. We are ahead of all countries in uh, BPO in uh, offshoring, in uh, so many things which are related to computers. Maybe you can explain to us what you understand by broadband. Well, broadband was recently defined by the president of the U.S. Say, who said it's fast speed always on internet. Simple terms, fast speed always on internet. You can be interactive on that, otherwise it's internet. So, <clears throat> when I looked at the sector, I found that uh, our penetration was 2 in 10,000. Now, we are a knowledge-based economy, 2 in 10,000. Our people are very familiar with computers, 2 in 10,000. So I thought that there was a space for uh, expanding broadband. So we did a consultation paper. We consulted everyone. And now we have uh, given some targets. But I think, like in telecom, we will far exceed those targets. What are the, what are the implications for business, for, for the average home of broadband? If you have broadband, if a housewife, a man, a student has broadband, then there are any number of connotations. E-education, e-medicine, uh, the government services being available not on the doorstep, right on your uh, computer. So basically, it's business on broadband, basically it's content on broadband, and all that is very important. But who will invest in this? You've got a connectivity of 2 in 10,000, so there is no business case. So this 2 in 10,000 and 2 in 10,000 will not go up because there is no content in business. So it's a vicious circle. And we thought that we have to break this vicious circle by a set of comprehensive reforms. We have finalized the package. Basically, we are breaking the vicious circle for the need of broadband. We are breaking the vicious circle of uh, prices in broadband, which are very high. And we are breaking the vicious circle of entry into broadband for operators. And I'm sure that uh, we'll be able to achieve the kind of growths that have never been seen in India before. Could you, for a, a layperson, uh, expand a little bit on the implications of uh, broadband? Uh, you know, and of course, we, we, we get a sense that if you have faster communication, faster utilization of the internet, that's, that's a nice thing. But uh, what kinds of uh, access, what kinds of practical advantages will that deliver? First of all, if you see, there are so many. ITC has done it. They have uh, gone to the villages. So the farmers are interacting on, uh, on uh, broadband. The farmers are interacting on internet. They're getting to know the prices in big mandis, and they are taking their decisions uh, on uh, selling their products. And they do don't have to go for large distances to the mandi to be able to take that decision. Today, if they want to take a decision, then they have to go to the Mandi, 30 miles, 40 miles. Now, wherever ITC Chapal has gone, they don't have to go, and it's a tremendous value addition. If you go to the south, there are some areas where a broadband is giving telemedicine, that you go to the broadband center, connect yourself to a doctor, 
and the doctor gives you advice on medicine. You see education, you can have interactive classrooms on broadband. The, the, the teacher do not have to go to each school, they can take uh, lessons. Now, you layman, you can uh, print out your ticket on broadband, you can print out your railway ticket, the railway minister has recently made it possible. So, sitting at home, you can do a number of things. Learning, you can download any, uh, any website and uh, get anything done. You can go to websites and do your transactions. Isn't so, broadband is something which makes you far more productive. Uh, I will tell you about uh, Korea. You know, we thought whether these growth rates are possible, we are 2 in 10,000. Why are we fooling around with broadband? Now, Korea, 99, it was 1 in 100. Today, it is 25 in 100. Japan, last year it was 7 in 100. Now, it has gone to 18 in 100. USA was 9 in 100 and recently the President of United States said that we must have larger broadband and universal service in broadband which means that each and every person has broadband. So, look at the communications, we are living in a communications age. Our people are very familiar with computers, they are very bright people. Now, if they have access to broadband, we will have the kind of possibilities which people in other countries have. And we can go very quickly right down to the last person with the least amount of expenditure. Uh, uh, broadband is sort of also inevitably linked with issues of convergence. But when you are able to in, in some ways deliver much higher speed connections of the internet, much higher volumes of data. Uh, so, the, uh, the, the use of the internet uh, expands dramatically and it also becomes a vehicle for, in, for entertainment uh, in the same cables that are laid. Um, you have been looking at issues of gas. In what ways do you think that the, the broadband revolution might begin to impact gas? Very caste? interesting <coughs> and a very topical question and very relevant for us. How many telephone lines do you have? 42 million? How many broadband connections, uh, uh, how many gas connections do you have? 55 million? So, you have this gold mine sitting and you can use this gold mine for telephony, you can use this gold mine for entertainment and you can use this gold mine for broadband. And there has to be convergence in this uh, gold mine. So, if you have a high speed broadband connection, you can replace uh, the cable operator by a telephone connection. You have uh, broadband connection on cable operator. So, you can give broadband, uh, you can give cable uh, TV, you can also give telephony. So, there is convergence in all three and this convergence you can achieve on cable TV or you can achieve on telephony. So, there will be more competition. The consumers will have larger choices. How did we have this 10 million to 30 million mobile telephones in one year? Larger competition and therefore, falling rates an aggressive fight with each other by all the providers and therefore, you had this growth. Cash the problem is that there is at present only one supplier. Now, when DTH comes in and when broadband comes in and consumers like you have three choices, obviously, the services will be better and obviously, the rates will fall and obviously, the services will grow. In this rapidly changing uh, scenario, how are you positioning this? How are you articulating these sort of, uh, in some ways, certainly in the short term, uh, a, a clash of interest between different stakeholders? You recall a couple of years back, you go to, a, you went to any market and there was a VCR shop. As a matter of fact, in some markets, there were two shops, there were three shops. Now, you do not see those shops because those shops have basically been taken over by cable TV because all the movies you uh, see cheaper by the dozen movies on uh, cable TV. So, the VCR shops have gone. And cable TV is a better and a quicker media of transmitting uh, those movies to the consumer. But even then, there is no choice what movie do you want to say, but there is a larger number of movies that are now available on TVs and therefore, the VCR has died. So, whichever technology is better, whichever technology is more consumer friendly, that will prevail. The other technology will try to compete and therefore, may turn itself to be a highly competitive uh, technology and the other technology will win. Now, let me take United States for instance. Now, in United States, both cable TV 
and broadband and telephony all three are prospering and DTH and DTH all are prospering. If you go to England only DTH uh, has survived but there are any number of reasons. The cable TV was not so competitive in or not so aggressive in the United Kingdom. So only DTH prospers there and cable TV does not. So the best technology will survive the technology which can give the maximum amount of service at the most viable price to the consumer will survive and that is what technology is all about. At the moment there is a perception that the sort of the more immediate uh, issue of gas has been hanging fire because of the elections. Um, what kind of time frame do you have? What kind of uh, blueprint seems to be follow, fall, falling into place? Uh, uh, well, uh, the work of CAS was given to the authority only two months uh, back. Of course, elections had been ordered that time, but I think elections were uh, accidental uh, that they were at the same time. Now, CAS is a very complex issue. A number of countries have gone through the same drill. They have gone through the same problems and have come to a solution. Now, luckily for us, we are the last country which is trying to find a solution. So, we have any number of models which are available. We are intensively studying the, those models and comparing it uh, with our situation and trying to find an appropriate solution. The problem is we have come in the last, so we carry the maximum baggage of the past. So we have to sort of match the best uh, solution with the baggage of the past and come to an uh, optimal solution. So what are the major challenges that you are confronting and, and, and need to resolve and what kind of time frame do you have in mind? Well, I suppose end of May we should give our final recommendation on CAS. At present uh, a consultation process is on. We are having the open houses on the 7th of May and uh, so end of May, early June we should be able to give our recommendations to the government. But it is complex because it requires a number of amendments. It requires amendments in the cab Cable TV Act, it um, uh, requires amendments in our regulation. We have to put a new regulation in place and we want, we do not want to rush into something and then come back. So we are examining all the models which are available around the world. You are watching a conversation with Mr. Pradeep Bajal of the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. We will be right back after a short break, do not go away. Welcome back. Uh, you have recently uh, been given uh, charge responsibility of helping chart the future uh, of radio, FM radio in, in, in particular holds uh, great interest. Uh, so far in the formulation that has emerged uh, pretty much as a very elite exclusive uh, uh, form. Uh, the Supreme Court in, has held that the airwaves need to cultivate diversity and plurality of views of their public property. Uh, in, 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 in the blueprint that is evolving for you, the ideas that are still sort of taking shape, to what degree are you committed to that and to what degree is that taking shape? Uh, the work of FM radio was given to the authority less than two months back and we have been studying uh, in the authority the possibilities in uh, FM radio and I for one am very excited because I feel that uh, there is a huge potential in FM radio. Uh, Last year when we joined in the authority, since the number of uh, mobile telephones were very few, they were still treated as uh, elitist property. This was the telephone of the rich. The rates were very high. Now today, this telephone is owned by a mason, by a carpenter, by a rickshawala because the rates have come down. Now let's come to FM radio. FM radio is a great thing an entertainment vehicle, a communication vehicle, a, an education vehicle and uh, can teach communities, cities, uh, factories. So it is a great communication media. In this century also only those will prosper who use communications the best. So I am very excited that if FM radio evolves properly it has a tremendous future. Now let me come to the present state. The present state is that we have got 22 stations, the entire country. There is a government report which says that this country can sustain 500 stations. We have done some rough calculations. I think we can sustain 1000 stations. But to sustain 1000 stations, again as in the mobile, the entry costs have to be low. The entry fee has to be low. 
there are no tariffs in radio, but the operating cost should be low. So that the service can be multiplied, so that the operator who comes in is able to establish himself. Now, if he makes a profit, then we can have taxes later, we can have higher revenue sharing, we can have a service tax on him. But to impose a tax and a high tax, but to impose uh, an entry fee and a high fee, and to impose entry restrictions and impossible entry restrictions, will not allow you to have a 1000 stations or 500 stations in one year, which you must have. So far, we have treated entertainment, education, everything as a government activity and that is why we had All India Radio, we had a government TV. Now, you have seen the, 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 the upside when you liberalize TV, when you have private channels. There are competing channels and they are all thirsting for more news and uh, better news and better coverage and therefore, you have a highly competitive sector which is trying to develop. On the radio side, other than these 22 FM radio stations and those two having any number of entry restrictions, there is nothing else, there is the All India Radio. But I see that in small communities, you can have community radios, in factory, you can have factory radios and in cities, you can have FM radios. But again, this will prosper if you have low entry costs. It will prosper if you allow the entrepreneurs and the great Indian entrepreneurs to set up this at low entry cost. You will have any number of community radios if you uh, stop all those checks which you do. You do hundreds of checks before you allow a community radio. So, therefore, we have to liberalize this sector and liberalize this it very effectively and since we have a huge market, we must learn to think big. What about the issues of uh, plurality, uh, of uh, equity, uh, of uh, you know, content? Uh, that is uh, reaching out to people who are not merely um, you know, attractive to advertisers in the models that have so far emerged. Uh, how do we look at what essentially public broadcasting is and, and, and create a space for that and, and for its survival, both on television and on radio, in all the models that you're developing, whether it's DTH or it's gas or it's the radio? Well, it's a very interesting question and uh, it brings about a lot of contradictory views. And we have gone for a consultation paper and I am sure that we will get answers to that contradictory view. Now, let me explain. Should the regulator or the government regulate content in a FM radio station? Should we say, no, no, one would be classical music, the other would be western music, the third would be local music, the fourth would be news or develop a large number of uh, stations, make the entry rules very simple and then let the stations evolve by what the consumer wants and we must have some kind of uh, balance between the two. But the moment we as a regulator or we as a government start intervening too much, uh, we have seen in the past that the results have not been very appropriate results. So that is the classic uh, disinvestment model, <laughs> uh, but I think the, you know the classic argument against disinvestment has frequently been uh, you know issues of equity, and uh, if it is really the consumer, uh, the consumer not just of the of the program but the consumer of advertising, which will then drive this, uh, you get vast sections of the community excluded uh, from the uh, the access, the privilege of radio and television, which is really what is happening. Uh, yes, I understand uh, that, but then you have to go back. Today, there is no license fee on radio. Today, there is no license fee on TV. Now, if I go to your model, then I'll have to say that, look, we must have a license fee for radio. Then, there'd be another very difficult question to answer. How do I share that license fee with these content providers who, according to my judgment, are giving uh, very good content and the state must subsidize them. Because in today's model, it is only advertisement revenue in FM radio or in any other radio. Or the other model is that the state subsidizes those stations. Now, you have to pick up uh, the best model and that is what the consultation is all about. Would not it be possible for uh, uh, some of the service tax that you talk about? Uh, to be diverted uh, to uh, programming, to channel, to content creation that was seen in, in the public interest. After all, you have different models of public service broadcasting in many parts of the world which have managed to survive and have reputations 
uh, for, for quality, for credibility, are, and are seen as essential components of equity and democracy. Uh, are you, can you evolve a model that excludes well, I have, uh, I have some views in the matter, but I'll be guided by what uh, the consensus appears after consultations. And we have thrown open our consultation paper to everyone. It is on our website. And we would look forward to uh, opinions ex expressed by experts like you. So please do give an opinion. <laughs> and we will positively consider that. But I, for one, would be very reluctant in evolving a model which is entirely dependent on government subsidies. Because that uh, always leads to inappropriate models. You are watching a conversation with Mr. Pradeep Bajal of the Telecom Regulation Authority of India. We will be right back after a short break. Welcome back. To touch briefly on, 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 on mobile telephony, in a sense, which is where uh, uh, you know, TRAI started, uh, you have been through a very turbulent process uh, with this. Uh, how difficult, how challenging has it been, and what do you feel are the elements of your success? You've made it work. It was a very exciting process. And uh, there was a period when all newspapers wrote long editorials against the follies that we had committed and the follies that we were imposing on telephony and the operators. Uh, today, each one of them come and congratulate me. Because we decided to take a path and pursue it. Of course, that path was not in the interest of so many stakeholders. But we decided on a path, and we pursued it, and we were successful. When we were successful, there was a huge growth, because we were committed that if we take this path, there will be a huge growth. And in a country where the penetration of mobile telephony was 10 million in a population of 1,000 million. We, th uh, we thought that uh, we cannot have these low penetration figures and therefore growth was the most important thing. We pursued on that path. We removed the barriers between different class of licensees. We removed so many uh, roadblocks. We removed uh, all kinds of barriers. We kind of facilitated or forced the tariffs to go down and we had a huge success. So ultimately and at the end of the day, I feel that in India, for anyone to be successful, he has to assure that the price is right, that the consumer is not being exploited. A model where you have uh, a mobile telephone at 32 rupees a minute, that is where it started, that is not a sustainable model, that is not a viable model. And therefore, the most important thing in the Indian market is that the price should be right because the consumer in India is highly price sensitive. And that is why we were successful, we were lucky. And I am sure this 30 million market by the end of next year would be a 100 million market. And now everyone is uh, coming to India, all operators, all uh, manufacturers, suppliers. Now suddenly people find that there is a country, India, in the mobility market. So if we are aggressive, then uh, we can achieve that for other sectors as well. There were several other nuances to it. The fact that you uh, made sure there was an element of uh, competition, uh, that um, you ironed out several administrative problems, you intervened when there was chaos and confusion. So it was also uh, an interventionist approach. And I'm interested in, in, in someone who, has, who started the disinvestment ministry. How do you reconcile the role of a regulator to sort of disinvestment when the market decides? Well, uh, even disinvestment, you are aware that there is need for intervention. Now, let me talk about disinvestment. You see, when we talk about disinvestment, we are talking about selling shares. We don't belong to me. Those shares belong to the public. Those shares belong to the taxpayer. I am the custodian of those shares. So I must build models where I am able to sell their shares at the maximum price. So that was the most important thing for us. And we evolved models. And everyone knows that we sold the shares at high prices. So it was not uh, that market decided the price. The process ensured that we got uh, high prices. Now let me come to uh, telecom. Now telecom is typically a vertically integrated uh, and a vicious monopoly. To break that monopoly into 
uh, origination of call, carriage of call, termination of call, and having different operators at different ends, and then ensuring that the network uh, behaves in a disciplined manner, I do not think you can have a non-interventionist regulator. If you are a non-interventionist uh, regulator, then you are not worth your salt. The, 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 the taxpayer should not pay you a salary. Now, we found that the sector was divided into artificial barriers and we thought that it was necessary to remove those artificial barriers and we removed those artificial barriers. At the end of your term, sir, at uh, Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, what legacy would you like to leave behind? Uh, highest possible numbers because we can have highest possible numbers only when the service is good, the quality is good and when the tariffs are low. So, if we are aiming for high numbers, everything else will fall in place. Thank you very much, sir. That was a great privilege. Thank you.